Have you ever wondered when is the best time to perform a spell or a magical working? Well, you can do your magic at any time. There are specific times during the lunar cycle that are more or less aligned to your intention, and understanding and knowing this can help greatly enhance your magic. Now, not only that, understanding the flow of the lunar cycle can also help you find more ease in your mundane life. So Merry Meet, I'm Aislinn, this is Ask Aislinn, and I am here tonight talking all about lunar timing and magic. So welcome to those who are joining us live. I see Melinda is here, Merry Meet. Anyone who's here live can drop some comments in the chat. We're also gonna have a Q&A at the end. And I am just gonna dive right in. We have a lot to talk about tonight. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is the lunar cycle divided into two halves, waxing and waning, and then we're going to dive deeper into the more specific subdivisions of each half of the cycle. And I'll give you some ideas of different types of magic that you can perform at different parts of the cycle, as well as things to do in your mundane life that will help you find a little bit more peace. All right, Mary Meet, see others joining us. Kurt is here, hi, and Cindy and Misty. Hi, everybody, so great to see you. So when we divide the lunar cycle into two halves, waxing and waning, the waxing half takes place from new to full moon, and the waning half takes place from new, uh, full moon to new moon. So just for those who are live or who will watch this back in the next few days, we are in the waxing half of the cycle right now. We're only a few days past new moon. New moon was on Friday. We're recording this on Tuesday. That also puts us into the waxing crescent, which we will also talk about in just a little bit. Now, during the waxing half of the cycle, the moon itself is gaining light. We can see that every single night when we look up at it. And so this is a time of drawing in things, gaining, just to think about sympathetic magic. We see the moon increasing in its own energy. <clears throat> that means that our energy has the potential to increase as well. Now, um, there's a, very much an attractive part to the energy of the moon at this time of the cycle. And in the mundane world, you may notice that you have a little bit more energy. Now, you may not, and just because you don't doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. At the end, we are going to talk about people who have different cycles that don't really sync with the lunar cycle. But in general, the world around us seems to have more energy, which means the majority of us probably feel that as well. Now, at the waning moon, on the other hand, that is a time of banishing, releasing, and letting go. The tides are going out, and as they go out, they have the ability to take anything that you cast out with them. In the mundane world, you may feel like you have less energy during the waning moon, and this isn't a negative thing. It's just simply an invitation to come inward a little bit, reflect on the things that are going on, perhaps find some balance in your life. So from this perspective, we have these two opposing energies, right? We have the waxing moon that is very attractive, and we have the waning moon that is very receptive. So at the very least, if a person were not to pay attention to anything else, um, they, I would recommend that they pay attention to these two halves of the cycle and know which one we're in at any given time. Now, it's not too hard to know. I, I do recommend that any witch kind of be able to look up this at the sky and see what, what phase we're in. So when we are in the waxing moon, you'll see that the growing side is on the right side from our perspective looking up. And when we're in the waning moon, the growing or the, the larger side will be on the left side of the moon as it's, um, as it's diminishing and going down until at the very, very end, there will be just this tiny little sliver on the left side, which means we're at the very end of the cycle, moving from dark moon into new moon. And then it all begins again. Now we can also look at this from a more deep perspective. This is where we're gonna look more closely at the subdivisions that fall into the waxing and the waning halves. And each of these subdivisions tend to last a couple of days. There's overlap you're gonna see as we get into them. There's definitely some overlap, but they all do have unique energies. Uh, some of them actually have different types of goddesses that are tied to them. There are different things that are better to do in our mundane lives during these parts of the subdivisions of the cycle. And this will help you 
um, time your magic more properly and also find more ease in your own cycle. So we are going to start with new moon. This is days one to two. Sometimes people will say days one to three. It all really depends on how easily we move out of the new moon energy. Now, one thing that I, I want to note about the new moon is that the new moon rises at sunrise and it sets at sunset. And why I'm bringing this up is because it's a good time to take pictures. Because the moon is so close to the horizon, you'll see it much bigger when it's at the new moon. Now, you won't see a whole lot because like I said, mentioned earlier, when we're on the dark half of it, you're going to see that little sliver on the left side. And once we get to the new moon, you're only going to see a little sliver of the moon on the right side. Nevertheless, you can get very beautiful pictures, especially at sunrise, at sunset, I should say. Now, moving into what does, what does the new moon mean? So during the new moon, the moon is between the sun and the earth. This is why we only see a bit of it. And our intentions typically have to do with new beginnings. Re, uh, one mantra I like for the new moon is rebirth yourself back into light. So especially if you came through the dark moon, which we'll talk about at the end of the cycle in more detail, but if you came through the dark moon and the energy is kind of sluggish and stagnant and you're not feeling really great, the new moon is that has that ability to just kind of rebirth us back into that light. The new moon is the perfect time for setting intentions you get to decide what the theme of the next cycle will be. And this is a very empowering feeling for many people because sometimes it feels as though we're at the whim of the universe or we're kind of at the, at the mercy of all the forces around us, but really we have much more power to choose the goals and the direction of our life during that phase than we believe. And so at the start of every cycle, you can set the intention. What is this? What is this cycle going to be about? And it doesn't matter if the last four cycles all kind of ended in a bad way, right? Or you weren't happy with the outcome or the progress in your life. Every single new moon, you have the opportunity to rebirth yourself. And to me, that is the most beautiful part of witchcraft and following the lunar cycles is just knowing that we always have the chance to start over. And it happens every 29 and a half days. Now, in the mundane world, when a person is in the new, when we're in the new moon phase, it may be a time of low energy. And um, because really it can be difficult to transition out of that dark energy um, very easily. So if you feel that you're at that space in the new moon, take it easy. It's a good time for a lot of self care. We'll see at the dark moon, that's also a time of a lot of self care. And so there's some overlap between the dark and the new moons, but it is the time to just pamper yourself. If you feel like sleeping in and you can do that, do that. You know, if you want to turn down an invitation to go somewhere because you need to rest, do that. The new moon invites you to. Now, as we move into the waxing crescent, this is days three through six. Now here in the waxing crescent, the energy begins to accelerate a little bit. We're nowhere near the peak of the cycle yet. But this is a time when you may start to feel like you've got a little bit more energy. Maybe that intention that you set at the new moon, now you're starting to think about it. The waxing crescent moon is a very good time for daydreaming. So I like to tell people, make some space in your life to daydream. Allow the intentions that you set at the new moon to play out in your mind. Um, it's a good time to fantasize. What would it be like if the intentions came true? Um, can you know what can you see any stumbling blocks all of those like this is all about the intentions in our head now if at the waxing crescent it's a time when you absolutely can relax you don't have to take action right away but um, it's a great time to send wishes and dreams out to the universe now the waxing crescent and the waxing moon in general but the waxing crescent specifically is associated with the maiden phase of the triple goddess so this is the goddess in her very energetic and youthful state it is a great time for long-term drawing magic now what i mean by that is that anything done during the waxing crescent will grow stronger over time so if you have an intention that you want to kind of strengthen as, it, as, the, as the cycle progresses, the waxing crescent is a perfect time for that kind of spell. So 
best types of spells for the waxen crescent, which by the way, we are in the waxen crescent right now. So these would be really good kind of workings for right now. Intentions that are gonna take quite a bit of real world planning or groundwork and preparation. So here would be some ideas like buying a house or applying for college or job searching. So these three topics tend to be pretty big intentions, right? And they take a lot of planning. Like if a person's applying to college, they have to do research on which colleges they want. They'll have to probably go and visit some of the schools. They may have to call and talk to people. They have to fill out their applications. They have to figure out their funding, right? So there's a lot of real wor world groundwork and preparation. So that would be a great spell for the Waxen Crescent because you're in that perfect energy that's gonna back you and it's gonna grow as the cycle grows as well. Um, so that would be the waxing crescent. Now let us move on then into the first quarter moon. And by the way, anybody who's, um, who's here live, feel free to ask any questions or leave anything in the chat as well. And it doesn't specifically have to be about the phases, but if you have anything um, to add too about how you feel during specific phases of the moon, we'd love to hear from you. And that goes for anybody watching in replay as well. So the first quarter, uh, the days of the first quarter are days seven to eight. Um, so even though it's typically people will think of the first quarter as being one day, it, the energetically it usually falls between the seventh and the eighth day. Now here's the deal about the first quarter. All that stuff we talked about, about the waxing crescent, right? Putting energy be behind long-term plans, kind of daydreaming and fantasizing, things like that. You probably know it's rather easy to get stuck in your dreams and your plans, right? And so that is kind of what happens at the first quarter moon for some people. Uh, the planning is good, but we eventually need to take some action. And so the first quarter moon is a good time to ask yourself, well, what is a small action that I could make right now that would help me gain some momentum in my intention or some momentum in what I want in my life? Now, the moon itself during the first quarter is half illuminated and half in shadow. So if you were looking at the sky, you're going to see the illuminated side on the right side of the moon. So it's a good time to check your balance because the moon is half in light and half in shadow. It reminds us we are too. So it's a good time to think about where in my life am I spending most of my energy as opposed to where do I not spend very much energy and am I happy with the way that I'm divvying out my energy, right? So it's a good time to kind of reflect on that. It would also be a good time for chakra balancing because of that balance aspect or um, doing any energetic balancing in your body. Now you can use the quickening energy of the first quarter to move past any resistance you're feeling. So if you are feeling resistance towards anything in life or your intention in general, you can use this energy to kind of harness it and push you past that into the waxing gibbous. Now, when we get to the waxing gibbous, the energy starts to really accelerate because we're getting closer and closer to the peak of the cycle, which is the full moon. Now, the waxing gibbous takes place on days 9 to 13, and it's a great amplification and acceleration of energy. So if you feel um, that your motivation is faltering here, it's a good time to kind of envision the joy that you're gonna feel when your intention comes true, when it comes to fruition. The waxing gibbous is also a very good time for spell work that you want to increase over time. So spells for things that you want more of. So I like spells at this time for confidence, right? So anything that you want, we start with some confidence and then we want more and then more and then more until we've really tapped into our self-belief and our confidence. Like a quick money spell. So unlike a job spell that we might do during the wax and crescent where it's going to take some footwork and legwork to get that working or get that moving, a quick money spell where we just need uh, some money to pay the bills, right? Or a quick injection into our savings account that would be a really great one during the wax and gibbous phase. Simple healing spells, spells that don't really require a lot of real world, world planning are very good at the wax and gibbous. 
Now the aspect of the goddess, the triple goddess, that um, at this point of the cycle is the mother goddess and she will kind of reign through the waxing gibbous phase and into the full moon. And we'll notice when we get to the full moon, it's also a good time to work with especially mother goddesses, goddesses of the moon that can aid us with their energy. Now that brings us then to the full moon. So just like at the new moon where we said the new moon is days one to two, the full moon is usually thought of as the energy falls between days 14 and 15 of the cycle. Now uh, I am going to put in the chat right now um, a link that you can use to find out what time all these different phases change. Um, so let me attempt to put that in the chat right now. Actually, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why I can't see the bottom of the chat. So I will put that in as soon as I can. Um, this is weird. Okay, <laughs> can't put that in right now. But um, in a moment when I put that in, you will be able to use it to determine what phase of the moon it is in at any given time. It's also gonna show you the moon sign, which is very helpful. And it will show you the time. You'll be able to change it for your specific zip, uh, zip code. So you'll know exactly that the times are, are correct. And you'll be able to see specifically like the peak of something like the full moon. Now the full moon is the height of our creative lunar power. It rises near sunset and it sets near sunrise and, um, or so, sorry, it sets near dawn. And so the beautiful part about that, like with the new moon, it is um, a very good time to take pictures because the moon is very close to the horizon as it's getting dark and it's still dark at sunrise. So you still have a bit of darkness to take some really very quite beautiful pictures of the full moon. Now the full moon is a good time for charging crystals and moon water. We'll talk a little bit more about moon water at the end uh, because it is a way that we can offset doing spell work and magical workings at a time that might not be ideal with the energy of that part of the cycle. The full moon is a good time for just attraction spells in general. It's very potent energy if the, if the moon is at the very peak of its power. Um, now one thing I did want to mention because I've seen something kind of going around over the past couple years, I would say, that is a bit interesting to me. And, um, and it's, it's not something that I ever learned. And I, I'm curious, I'm not entirely sure where it comes from, but I've seen people say that the full moon is best for releasing things. And uh, this is very strange to me because I've practiced witchcraft for nearly 30 years. And this was never something that I learned in any of my books. To me, the full moon feels very much like manifestation and the dark moon is about releasing. But I have seen more and more people kind of talking about, they think that the full moon is about releasing. And I think it's a good time to talk about the energy that people carry in their own body. So if someone feels like the full moon is a good time to release something, then it is for them. In general though, in my opinion, the natural cycle of the, of the lunar um, flow of energy would suggest that the full moon is more about peak of power, which feels less releasing to me and more like drawing in. And if you kind of think about um, the menstrual cycle in general, which it doesn't matter what gender we are to appreciate the analogy, the period is like uh, the releasing that takes place at the dark and the new moons and ovulation takes place at the, at the um, the 14th day, which would be aligned to the full moon. So that doesn't mean that everybody's cycle sinks to the full moon in any way. But if you kind of think of that as an analogy, we can see that the 14th or 15th day is the height of energy. And it's where a person would potentially conceive a child, which is the magic of manifestation. So just some food for thought and things to think about. But again, and we'll talk more about this at the end, it is also important to consider your own energy and that doesn't necessarily have to align with the natural energy of the lunar cycles. Um, a, a few other things about the full moon. The full moon is a good time for drawing down the moon. So for those who've never done drawing down the moon before, it's um, not as complicated as it, as it seems sometimes. Uh, a person can start just simply by standing underneath the moonlight and just imagining them absorbing the energy of the moon, bringing that powerful and potent energy down into them, allowing it to kind of 
sit in their bodies and then perhaps directing it into spell work later if they want to. Uh, eventually, a person can work towards drawing down a lunar deity as well when they're drawing down the moon. And this is also a time when many people will use the word esbet, which is a celebration, a ritual of some kind, most often tied to the full moon. It's often a time when people can do spell work because of the potent energy of the full moon. But sometimes people just want to honor a goddess at the, at the full moon or, or perhaps a god as well. And, um, and just be grateful and thankful and just kind of revel in the energy of the full moon. Um, and I'm just going to pause for a second um, and just see what is in the chat here. So Misty said she's definitely been feeling like in a dreamy mood all day yesterday and today, very much aligned to the wa waxing crescent for sure. Cindy asked what stone I'm wearing. It's beautiful. Thank you. So this stone is actually a uh, fire agate and I got it at a gemstone convention for $5. I don't know <laughs> how I found such a great deal. Um, okay, so let us then shift into the waxing half of the cycle and the subdivisions of that. So immediately once the full moon passes, we are in the waning gibbous. Uh, this is day 16 through 21, but it's not often immediate that we feel this energy. So kind of like um, moving out of the new moon and taking a couple of days to kind of feel energetic again, the same thing can happen at the full moon. We are in that kind of magnified, potent energy. People, Some people feel really amplified and energetic. It's not uncommon to not be able to sleep. I've just really given up resisting that at the full moon. And I just appreciate the energy I have and I try to put it towards creative endeavors rather than getting mad at myself because I'm not gonna get much sleep during that period. But it can take a bit of time once we get into the waxing, or sorry, waning gibbous for us to actually feel that the energy has slowed down. We still may feel a little like kind of jacked up, right? Um, so the manifestation is complete for the cycle when once we kind of move into that waning half of the cycle. And for the first few days, though, you may feel like you're kind of riding high on that energy, and then that energy begins to shift. Now, the waxing gibbous, I keep saying waxing gibbous, I mean waning gibbous, is a good time to pause and feel gratitude for what you have. In a lot of ways, you can kind of think about this time, especially as it gets closer to the third um, quarter, as being very um, similar to like Maybon energy or like fall equinox energy. It's a, it's a time of kind of reflection and gratitude. We've done the work, we've had the harvest, and now we are ready to be grateful for what we have, the fruits of our labor. So the same kind of thing happens at the, whack, the waning gibbous where we've done the manifestation, we've felt all that creative energy, it will come back again, it's not gone forever, but now we're moving into a part of the cycle where we're gonna feel a little bit more grateful and reflective, and we're gonna pause and think about things. Now, from a magical perspective, the, uh, the waning gibbous is a good time for banishing. The entire waning half of the cycle is good for banishing, but the waning gibbous in particular, you know, those like five or so days after the full moon, is very good for things that you want to gently disappear. So sometimes there are things that you want gone for good, right? You just want it, I want it gone, and I want it gone now. That's stuff to do near the end of the cycle. But in the waning gibbous, this is a good time to let go of stuff gently. So I'm sure you can think of some intentions where you wouldn't necessarily want them gone really fast, but you'd want them to let go slowly. Now, during the waning gibbous, the goddess is in her crone aspect, and so she very much can lend her wisdom and power to any of your intentions at this time. This is also a good time because of that kind of receptive energy that's amplifying People will notice that their intuition kind of kind of starts to heighten at the full moon and then continues to heighten even more as we move further into the waning half of the cycle. Now that eventually brings us to last quarter moon. Last quarter moon, like first quarter moon, we see the moon half illuminated and half in shadows. The last quarter takes place between days 22 and 23 of the cycle. It reminds us that there is a shadow within us as well. When we look up at that moon and we see the left half illuminated and the right half dark. 
This is an excellent time for our shadow work. It doesn't mean that we can't do shadow work at any time. We absolutely can, but you may feel drawn to do more during the third quarter moon. It's a good time to pause and reflect. A really nice question to ask yourself at the third quarter is what isn't serving me? Because remember, when we get to the third quarter, we're about seven days away from the beginning of the next cycle. And kind of going all the way back to the beginning of the talk tonight, we said that the new moon is the time when you get to start over every 29 and a half days. So at the third quarter, ask yourself, well, what do I not want to take with me into the next cycle? That's the thing I'm going to ditch now in the third quarter. The time for releasing is, is beginning once we cross over into the third quarter. That means that we're nearly at the waxing or waning crescent. So the releasing time will come. You may begin at the third quarter to kind of notice some of your blockages. They may, may feel more amplified. You may not know what to do with them yet, but you may begin to notice them. So just really contemplate here what needs more balance in your life. Just like at first quarter, we have these two times in the lunar cycle where we're really being asked to pause for a moment and just say, are things balanced? Where could I spend more time on the things that fill me up? And where could I spend less time on the things that drain me? And then that moves us into the waning crescent. Now the waning crescent takes place on days 24 through 26. Now here the energy is really beginning to slow down and it's very natural for people to want to rest. So if you notice that about yourself, I've said this before, we live in this kind of go, go, go world that really forces us to not listen to our bodies at all. I really wish that people could just call into work and say, I need a day to rest. And they could be compensated for that because I think we'd have a lot happier workers and a lot uh, better running society if we could get in the habit of things like that. Um, but if that's not possible, it's at least it's at least possible to find a way to rest somehow, maybe sleep a little bit longer, uh, turn down invitations that you don't want to keep, you know, um, and, and just really honor yourself. Now, um, we may be drawn to more restorative practices during the waning crescent moon. Uh, so good time for like yin yoga and restorative yoga, somatic yoga, um, really honor, honor this energy and slow down and unwind. It's a sacred time that's related to our birth and our, our death and our rebirth every cycle, right? So that segues into the final three days of the waning crescent are called the balsamic moon. Now, the intentions that we have during the waning crescent are the same as the intentions during the balsamic moon, just more amplified. This is days 27 to 29, so the very end of the cycle, the last 72 hours. Some people may feel more anxious and depressed um, and more triggered during this time. So it's important for us to normalize that. Um, it's also important for us to kind of think about, though, what's causing the anxiety and what's causing the depression. Because sometimes what it can be is that we're either maybe we're disregarding our own emotions or our needs and that causes some anxiety. It could also be that we are feeling more just receptive to energy in general which means we're picking up energy from other people. So some of the depression and the anxiety may not even be our own. So really starting to understand our own emotions as opposed to other people's energy can be helpful. It can take some time, but it is a good place to start. And, um, and just kind of noticing too, is like if we sort of ignore this, ignore this energy and we're not really syncing with it very well, this may amplify these kind of uncomfortable feelings. Now, what I also wanted to mention too is that the veils do get a little bit thinner at this time and, um, and just we're picking up more. So uh, try not to resist it because when we resist our emotions, when we resist our feelings, it tends to only make them worse. So we wanna to try to lean into them. What could they be trying to teach us? This is primo time for like self-care, really take care of yourself so you can better understand what you're going through and just kind of allow your triggers to teach you. Again, prime time for shadow work. Um, good time for releasings of any kind. At the, we talked a little bit about the waning gibbous is a good time to let go of things you want to release gently. 
The balsamic moon is a good time and leading into the dark moon is a good time to let go of stuff you want to make sure stays gone. So if you want something gone now, you're going to immediately quit something or get rid of something. The dark moon and the balsamic moon, best time to do that. A good time for cord cuttings, banishings, and releasings of any kind. Then that finally moves us into the dark moon, which again, all of this is still part of the waning crescent and the balsamic moon. And then that dark moon is the final day of the cycle. Now, rarely will you see that li listed on a moon cycle chart. Uh, what you would do to figure out when the dark moon is, is you would go to the time of the new moon and you count backwards 24 hours and that would be the start of the dark moon. Now this is a good time to let go. My mantra during the dark moon is shed your skin um, because the new cycle is gonna start the very next day. And anything that we let go of opens up space for something more. So if we move through the dark moon and we don't try to let go of something energetically, what we may find is that kind of energy stays with us. It moves with us into the next cycle and now we're carrying it. And if it's something that's not really serving us, we, first of all, number one, we don't have as much room for the things that we want to manifest or we want to draw in for the next cycle. And then number two, the longer the energy stays in the body, the more stuck and stagnant it becomes. Doesn't mean we can't get rid of it. We always can. But you have this perfect time at the dark moon to just purge yourself of energy you don't want to take with you. Now, the goddess here in her crone aspect is then reborn as the maiden. And, um, and that closes the lunar cycle and then moves us into the new moon once again, where we are reborn back into the light. So I wanted to, before we go to the Q&A, I did want to mention um, paying attention to our own lunar cycle. And I also wanted to mention um, a bit about what to do if you wanted to do spell work and it's not really the most um, aligned time during the lunar cycle. I wanna give you a couple of tips for that as well. But now I'm back to being able to see the chat. And so I am actually going to drop this link down into the chat. I hope that went somewhere. It's a big, crazy link. There it is. Um, so that calendar is set to Los Angeles because that's where I live. So anybody who wants to use that calendar will be able to go to the top of it. You'll be able to put your zip code in. It will immediately re recalculate all the times for you. And then you'll also notice near the top of that calendar, you can choose right now, it should be set for July, but when August comes, you can put it into August. Or if you want to go backwards and find out what, um, what time of uh, the cycle, let's say there's a time of the cycle that you were not feeling really great, you can go back and you kind of look at that in an older cycle. Um, and then Kurt is asking me if I'm feeling better than last time because he saw me on, um, we met for the dark moon, new moon to do a ritual for our shadow seekers membership. And I was not feeling well then, <laughs> and I am feeling much better now. So sometimes it's just that energy kind of hits us, um, strangely in some cycles. Generally, I find when I feel that way, it's because I didn't listen to my body and I probably push through too much during the cycle and then it sort of catches up kind of at the end of the cycle. But thank you for asking. I'm definitely feeling much better. Um, okay, so paying attention to your own natural cycle. So what I recommend people do, if you've never done this, it's a neat experiment. It requires you to do this for about two to three lunar cycles or two to three months, um, but it's very little time each day. You schedule in about a minute or so. And what you would do is you would write down the date and then you would go to um, a calendar like the one I put in the chat here and you would write down the phase of the moon, right? So today we would write down the date and then we'd write down waxing crescent. And then what you want to do is write down a few words about how you're feeling energetically, how you're feeling emotionally and how you're feeling physically. And it should take you one minute to 90 seconds done, put it away and then you come back the next day and you do it. Now, if you follow this for two to three cycles, you may start to notice some patterns. And some people will notice that they almost perfectly aligned to the lunar cycle. They feel energetic at the full moon. Maybe they can't sleep, right? Um, as they start to get into um, the, the last quarter, they're feeling like, oh, I wanna balance myself a bit. They get down into the dark moon. They kind of feel like I wanna let go of something. The new moon comes, I'm ready to set intentions. And some people will, will feel that way. 
And then other people will notice that their cycles are a little bit different and they may find that they're very energetic at the dark moon. Totally fine, I wanna normalize that. People's cycles do not need to sync with the natural cycle, but you would never know that if you didn't track it. And so that's why I recommend that people track it at least for two to three months, just so you get an idea of where your cycles line up. Um, now, one word about people who have a menstrual cycle, they may find that their menstrual cycle kind of is going to um, change the way that their energy feels during the lunar cycle. So if they're, let's say they, they have a period kind of midway on this through the cycle or at the full moon or something, the full moon then can feel like a dark moon to them because their body is releasing energetically uh, the blood, right? And, um, and they also feel like they want to release something energetically as well. So that is why tracking the cycles can be so valuable. And you may find that they flip flop too. Like sometimes you'll feel that the, the, the new moon um, is, is where you want to set intentions. And sometimes you'll feel that, <laughs> that it's not, but you wouldn't really know that unless you tracked it. So that's why I recommend regardless of gender, track your cycle and just kind of get an idea of what your natural flow is. Also keep in mind that if you find that your cycle is different than the natural cycle, uh, then just keep in mind that the majority of the world is on that natural cycle, which means that your cycle may be a little off from them. It's nothing wrong about you. It's just something to keep in mind. You're feeling like you want to be more receptive and then other people are feeling like they want to be energized, right? So you just want to keep that in mind about yourself at that time. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention before we move into the Q&A is what to do if you want to do a magical working and it's not, it doesn't seem like it's the most opportune time energetically uh, as far as being aligned to the lunar cycles. So let's say a person really needs to do a, um, like a banishing ritual, right? And it is like wait, waxing crescent. So it's not really the best time energetically for that kind of energy. At least I should say it's the energy is not as aligned as it could be than if we were trying to do that banishing during the waning crescent, for example. So what a person can do is if they absolutely need to do the spell and they can't wait for the more opportune time in the lunar cycle, you can offset that by um, getting some lunar water that is tied to different phases of the lunar cycle. So what you can do is you can put out moon water. A lot of people put out the water for the full moon. And so if you've never done moon water before, it's very easy. You just put a jar of water out, put it underneath the full moon or on like a windowsill where it can see the, the moon's energy and then uh, and absorb it. And then what I would recommend doing is definitely bring it in before the sun comes up. Otherwise it will also be infused with solar energy. And in this case, we're trying to create um, water that is only infused with full moon energy. Um, so that is one thing that people will often do, but what they forget that they can do is they can actually put that water out during any phase of the lunar cycle. So, um, so let's go back to that person who wants to do the banishing ritual at the waxing crescent they could put out some water during the dark moon, label it with the dark moon and the date, and then you have that for when you wanna do a banishing ritual during the first half of the cycle when the energy isn't quite as aligned. So it's just a nice little way to kind of offset that energy when you need to do a working and you feel like you can't wait for a time that's a little bit more aligned. Now a second thing you can do is play with the wording of your intention so let's say a person wanted to do like a job um, finding spell. So see job finding is drawing in, right? And they absolutely need to do this spell right now and they find themselves smack in the middle of the waning moon and they don't really want to wait for the, um, for the waxing moon. So they could use the water, that they could use that idea. Or the other thing you can do is you can change the wording of your intention. So rather than say, my intention is to find a job, we could say my intention is to release any blockages that keep me from finding the right job. And see how I've, essentially I'm doing like the same spell, but I'm changing the intention so that it's a little bit more aligned to that part of the lunar cycle. So that's just a few a little food for thought on how we can kind of work with um, these lunar cycles and do work, especially if it doesn't feel quite as aligned. 
uh, for, with that part of the cycle. All right, so now I'm going to open it up for the Q&A, and then I don't, I just don't understand why sometimes I can see the bottom of the comments and sometimes I can't. Let me see here. Okay, now I can see them. Um, um, okay, and then Kurt has a good question here. So he said, can you charge items the same way as the water in that scenario? Absolutely, yeah. So if you want to have a talisman that, let's say you want to have that charged, like maybe you want to have a talisman or something charged for full moon and one for dark moon that you could then bring in, you could absolutely do that. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of anything else, crystals, things like that. You know, people typically will charge the crystals at the full moon, but you absolutely can charge them with dark moon energy too and bring them in when you kind of need that kind of energy and vice versa, charge with full moon and then bring them in when you need the full moon kind of energy. Good question. Okay, so um, I'm going to move to the Q&A. I have a few questions here. Anybody who's live, you've got some time to put some questions in the chat. Again, they don't have to be about um, lunar energy. It can be about anything related to witchcraft, shadow work, or energy work. I'm going to start with the ones that were sent to me, and then we will go from there. Um, so Kurt had a good question he sent earlier about... Um, uh, invoking versus evoking. So he said, I know about calling the quarters and the god or goddess. Is that any different than invoking or evoking? And if so, what's the difference? So, um, so the first thing that I think to kind of remember is that typically when we call the quarters, we typically evoke. Uh, when you call a god or a goddess, you may evoke or you may invoke. And, and some people may have different opinions on this, so I'm just going to kind of share my perspective on it. So evoking is typically about drawing the energy into the space where you are. So if we evoke a goddess or a god, we basically ask them to be present in our space. And invoking is where we actually draw them into our own bodies. And there may be times when we want to do that, um, as opposed to a simple evocation. Evocations tend to be simpler, which is why beginning students are recommended to start with evocations first. Call the energy, call the deity, call the quarters, call everything into your space and get good at doing that. Now there may come times when a person may want to draw that energy into their body and allow it to be there and speak through them or move through them and that is the invoking. Um, drawing down the moon is why a lot of people don't talk a ton about it is because it is typically an invocation and it's a little bit harder. And so it, especially in the group that I was um, initiated into first, the invocation, um, the drawing down the moon was reserved for the high priestess or someone who had trained for a long time because invocation is harder than evocation. So all the students would be trained to evoke and then eventually some would step up into kind of that role where they might be training to be a high priestess and then they would start the invocation or at least learning how to do it. Um, now, here's my opinion about this. So I came from that tradition I waited to learn how to invoke and then I did it. And um, honestly, the first few times it was just reciting something and I didn't feel a whole lot. And it really wasn't until I, I remember this one time at the ocean and I was like, I didn't even intend to invoke any deity of any kind. I just was kind of standing at the ocean and, um, and I did the, my drawing down the moon and then I felt, I, I literally felt like the presence of the goddess in my body and I was myself, I absolutely had total control over my own body, but I also felt that there was this presence that was gently kind of urging me to move a certain way and, um, and then it led me to dance. And that's not something I typically do. So that is oftentimes um, a sign that you have invoked is where you are sort of feel moved to make a movement or to do something that isn't like something typically that you do. Now, sometimes when people invoke, they lose all sense of themselves at all, and they will lose all memory of what has happened as well. Now, that has not been the case for me, and it could be just I have a kind of a line drawn that doesn't allow that to happen. I'm happy to share my presence with the deity, but I've never crossed over that far. Other people 
have done that and they will tell you they don't really have any memory of the invocation at all. So just some kind of food for thought. I would definitely recommend beginning students start with, um, you know, start with the evocations, get good at just calling deity to your space. Um, but you can always try that experiment like I did. I just sort of like let go of my energy and just was drawing down the moon and, and then I felt her um, in, inside my body. So very, very loving and beautiful feeling. So I hope that helps though. That's kind of a, <laughs> a long drawn out answer, but the difference between invoking and evoking, evoking you draw to the space, invoking you draw inside of you. Okay, next question. Um, this one comes from Jennifer. And she said, what is the best way to begin working with a deity? Uh, what do you say do? Is there a general format that can be used and modified based on the deity? Um, and then she went on to elaborate a little bit. Um, she said, I know about offerings and things like that, but what exactly do you say this is after the deity has already reached out to her, to you? Um, okay, so good question, um, and she kind of saw ahead of where I was going to begin to answer the question. And for those who are just in general want to work with a deity, uh, one of the best places to start is with offerings and intentions. And um, it's just making an intention to connect with a deity and then finding out a little bit about what they might enjoy, placing that offering on an altar, building an altar for them. These are kind of the first steps um, if you can't figure out what the deity uh, would like as an offering, wine, water, uh, flowers, those are common offerings that are often used. Now, in the case of Jennifer, she said she kind of already knows about all of that. This is a deity that's reached out. And I think for her, it's more about what do I say to that deity? And, um, and so I think that um, there's kind of two ways I can answer this. So one is that many times, people's experience of deities is um, a bit different than they imagine, especially if they came from like a Judeo-Christian um, upbringing. So in the Judeo-Christian upbringing, we are taught that um, the priest kind of holds that red phone to God, like everybody else is sort of an intercessory. We can't really experience true deity ourselves. Um, we need kind of the priest to tell us what to do, what to say. We have the Bible, everything right. Um, and my experience of the pagan gods is very different than that. Um, we don't really need anybody to tell us what to say. You just speak um, to the deity, uh, honestly, in, in many ways, as you would speak to um, a friend or someone that you cared about or someone you wanted to talk to. You can ask them um, what, like in her, Jennifer's case, she said the deity had reached out to her. Ask the deity, what, what, um, why are you here? Um, what can I learn from you? And just setting those like kind of humble intentions can be really eye-opening. They seem so simple, but they can actually be so um, profoundly impactful. Now, the second way of kind of talking to a deity, and, and I'm not sure you may want to know both of these, so I figured I would talk about this too, is doing an evocation. So this is kind of nice that it followed Kurt's question about the difference between evocations and invocations. So evocations is where we want to call the deity to the space and we want to honor them in some way. And um, so we do have, there's typically four pieces that are used in an in evocation or an invocation. Um, and this is specificity, description, praise, and need. And when it comes to specificity and description, it's basically so that we don't get the wrong, we don't call the wrong deity. Many of the deities have overlapping stories and myths. And so with specificity, if we were going to write an evocation, you know, let's say we're writing to Hera, oh, Her beautiful Hera, queen of Zeus, or um, uh, yeah, queen of Zeus, wife of Zeus. Now we have been very specific of who we're calling, right? And then we can say there can be a description about what they look like. And so one of the best ways to kind of figure out what to say is to read more of their myths, kind of get to know their stories and weave that into the evocation that you're writing. And then from there, it's usually typical to praise the deity in some kinds. So I already did that by calling her beautiful, but I could do that in other ways like honored, um, you know, we praise you, different things like that. And then usually we will explain the need of why we're calling them. And you might have a specific need that you would say the intention then, 
or you could um, just be simply calling them to honor them, right, at, at the full moon or at, at Samhain or whatever. So that is sort of like a general kind of structure of an evocation that works really well. And so what I would recommend a person do is, um, you know, find like if there's a specific deity that you want to, that, you know, is kind of calling you and you want to write an evocation for them, just Google evocations to such and such a deity and see what comes up on the internet and or just evocations in general and just see how people have written them and that will give you ideas on what to do as well. Now I will mention for our Demystifying Witchcraft students and that course is opening up later this month um, for those who are not already enrolled in it, we do have a whole module on deities that goes through slide after slide of me writing evocations, putting in all four of these parts and, and basically creating a template that a person can use for any deity they want to use. Um, but until then, those four parts, you know, should, um, should get somebody going. And I would just recommend looking at other people's evocations to get some ideas. So I hope that helps answer your question. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question in the chat here, um, and then I'll go back to the ones I've been sent. Melinda said, would one be able to evoke the moon into their space as well? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, like any energy, you can absolutely draw energy and evoke energy into your space. So just like we evoke the, um, you know, we don't necessarily call it when we call the quarters. We don't always say we're evoking the quarters, but that's what we're doing. We're calling the energy of air and fire, water and earth into the space. There's no reason we couldn't evoke the moon into our space as well, or the sun, or um, the energy of a specific planet. Very good question. Okay, uh, next question is from Andrea, and Andrea, uh, she wants to know, what is my favorite way to do shadow work, and are there any books that I would recommend to learn more about it? And then she also says, and anything I could recommend to read to learn more about energy work. Um, okay, so I've got some books here. Um, they're some of the same ones I recommended before because they're so good, but for those who have not seen me recommend them, this will be um, kind of good. And then I'm going to share with you sort of my favorite ways to do shadow work. So hands down, if a person wants to do energy work, this was the first book I bought nearly 30 years ago. It's actually called The User's Guide to the Chakra System. This is Wheels of Life by Anadia Judith. She is considered probably the probably leading expert on the chakra system here in the West. Um, fantastic book, very accessible, goes through all seven chakras. And um, anybody who wants to start working with energy for any reason should really get to know their own energetic system. And this book will help you do it. So this book will go through how to know if chakras are balanced or not balanced and will give you ideas on how to balance them. So this is a fantastic book. Um, and I recommend these books so much that it's, I can't even tell you how many people have probably bought these books because I have said so. Um, but just, it's, I can't recommend this book enough. It's just so, so good. Um, as far as for shadow work, um, most of the books that I have read, I read back in grad school and they were very dense textbooks. Even reading Carl Jung is hard for people because he was writing, you know, early 1900s. Um, it's just a style of writing that's difficult to read sometimes. And not only that, but there's a lot of vocabulary and words that he uses that people at the time might have known, or um, if you were in kind of the psychoanalytic circles, you would understand it better. And for the layman today, kind of hard to understand. But one book that I did read in grad school that I thought was pretty good, this one's called Meeting the Shadow. And it's The Hidden Power of the Dark Side of Human Nature. It is a book that's edited by Connie Zwieg and Jeremy Abrams. It is a bunch of different essays by different writers on, chat, on the shadow, including Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and some of the really big ones. Robert Bly, he's another big one. Um, so I, I do like this book, not quite as dense as if you just grabbed like a textbook or a, um, a book by Carl Jung and it kind of will get your feet wet, get you kind of understanding um, what the shadow is all about. Um, if you want a book that's less dense, which many probably do, this book is not too bad. I've, I've actually recently been ordering some books on shadow work and energy work and I'm going to do a whole episode where I review some of these 
um, and just give people my pers my my <laughs> my real opinions on them. This book's not too bad. This one's called um, The Shadow Work for Chakra Healing Book and Journal by Alyssa, Alyssa Vera. Um, some of it feels a bit um, AI inspired to me. That's the only thing I can say negative about it, but it does have some nice prompts in it. And it goes one by one through the chakras and then talks about how you can do some shadow work around issues that would arise from those chakras being out of balance. So I really do like this and it has space in it where a person can, um, you know, a lot of it's a book, but it has some space where a person could journal. And I think overall, I've read through about half of it and it seems like it's a pretty, a pretty good survey of the chakra system and shadow work paired together. Um, now, as far as my favorite way to do shadow work, I personally, I love doing shadow work prompts during what I call shadow hiking or shadow walking and also during yin yoga. I like doing this during the kind of waning half of the lunar cycle, especially when we get kind of past last quarter, those last seven days of the lunar cycle. I love to get into a yin yoga pose, um, maybe specific to a certain chakra. So if I'm working with my solar plexus, I might get into a pose that's going to help me stretch my hips a little bit. And then the idea here is that we're not going to move out of that pose for about three to five to seven minutes. And during that time, you can absolutely just sort of contemplate, just see what comes up as the energy of your body begins to relax of the physical body. What that means is you'll start to move into your energetic body and then into your emotional and mental bodies, which is really where our shadow work takes place. So it makes it easier for us to access the unconscious when our physical body releases. So you can just sort of contemplate, just kind of sit there in contemplation or lie there in contemplation in this pose, or you can get some shadow work prompts, like a book like this could give you some, or you can just Google online shadow work prompts for a topic, the inner child, the mother wound, whatever it is you want to work on. Grab a, t a prompt or two that seems interesting to you and then just think about it while you're in that pose. That is my favorite way to do shadow work. I've gotten a lot done that way. Now, um, at the same time, I also like to kind of hike or walk near dusk. This can be done on any day. Dusk is the time most closely aligned to shadow work. And, um, and you can sort of contemplate anything during your walk. You, I would tell a person to kind of set this aside from being a normal kind of walk, just to walk for fitness or to walk for fun. This is a walk with a purpose, which means I wouldn't, I wouldn't take music with me. I wouldn't take a podcast, like nothing that's going to distract you. I'd turn the phone off. I mean, this is your time to do shadow work. So dedicate it to that and either just kind of walk during that space, that kind of transition space between day and night and see what comes up for you or take one of those prompts with you and kind of run it through your mind and see what comes up. And then the other thing I do want to mention too is that it's not unusual for like you to put that work in and not have an immediate aha moment. You don't have to have the aha moment like right at the time you're doing the work. Uh, but what you're doing is you're setting the stage, the receptive energy um, to kind of bring that material in from the unconscious. And you may have that aha moment, it, you know, when you wake up the next morning or a few days from now. Uh, but, but at least you're setting the stage and you're being very receptive by kind of playing with these prompts and, and these contemplative ideas. So I hope that all work or all that helps. And, um, and then I finally have a question from Terry. And she asked a question that I've heard other people have asked this before. So I know this is on, on people's minds. Uh, she wants to know how to choose a time for your birth date. Uh, if you don't know the time you were born and you wanted to calculate your ascendant. So the thing about the astrological chart is that the time of your birth time, your birth time is important because it, First of all, it sets the ascendant of the chart. And from there, it basically sets all of the houses of your chart as well. Now, you can absolutely not know your time and you can pretty much get all of your planets. You'll know what signs they're all in. You'll be able to do a lot of work with your chart. But for those who really want to know their ascendant, it's, the ascendant is a big part of the chart. Um, it's, it's a big question. What, what happens when we don't know when we were born? So I have a couple of thoughts on you. and It all depends on um, whether you have absolutely no idea 
or whether you might have an inkling of that time, okay? So if a person has absolutely no idea and there's no way to get the information, what we typically tell people to do is set it at 12 midnight and, um, and cast the chart with your birth time at 12 midnight and see if the chart feels right to you. See what that feels like to have that ascendant. Um, if that feels weird, set the chart for 12 noon and see if that fixes anything. Um, that's about the best that we can do when we have no idea what the time is and we are not going to like pay some money to get it rectified. So my second, my second recommendation outside of that is you can pay money to have the chart rectified. What, the, what that does is it's unfortunately it's not cheap um, because it takes a lot of time for someone to do it and you do have to find someone who's a real expert in this um, and they'll, they'll you, I'd ask questions like how many charts have you rectified you know uh, but there are people who have studied how to do it and what they will do is they will ask you a series of questions about like major events in your life and then they will actually figure out what time you were probably born for your chart to have that um, that specific set of um, um, events in your life. So that is one thought, that's another thought, you know, pay for the chart rectification. Um, now the third thing you can do is if you, if you have an inkling of when the time is. So for example, um, let's say you know that you were born sometime after midnight but before dawn. Let's say your mom remembers it was sometime in the middle of the night. What a person could then do is they can, um, the, the, the ascendant itself, it moves per sign to a different sign about every two or so hours, which means if a person knew they were born between 12 um, a.m. and 6 a.m., we really only have three signs in that time. And so you could put in the, you could put in 12 a.m., you could put in 2 a.m., you could put in 4 a.m., and you could see which of those gives you an ascendant that makes the most sense. Again, it's, that's going to take some time and a little bit of work on your part to just kind of input the different times and then see how the chart casts and what it looks like. But it is a way that a person could kind of get to that time if they have like a window that they think it is. But if you have no idea, I would just go with 12 midnight. That's the kind of the general way that we do it. And then just kind of know that um, it's an estimation. But I hope that helps. Um, all right, so I'm going to see if there are any other questions here. Um, Nancy said she loves the Wheels of Life book. I know it's such a good resource. And um, some of her other books are very good, too. Um, I just love Anna Dia Jewis. I actually um, am taking a course with her. It's like an asynchronous course, but I've been taking a course with her as well right now in the chakra system. She's a wealth of information. Um, okay, so if there's any other questions, put them in the chat. I'm just going to um, end here by talking a little bit about what's coming next, and that will give some space for um, people to put more questions in if they have them. Um, so what's coming up next? Next week, 716, I'm going to be doing an episode, um, I believe, on grounding shielding techniques, um, specifically for empaths, but anybody would, would benefit from this information, but specifically people who are more empathic and find that they're always picking up everybody else's energy. I'm going to share some ideas on um, you know, what to do about that. On 723, I have not decided on what the topic will be for that episode yet, um, but if anybody has any ideas, I know some people have been sending me some great ideas, and I've been kind of putting together some episodes for the future. If anybody has any ideas, send me some of those um, topics you'd like to learn more about. 7.30, we'll do an episode on Lunaza. And then um, on, I believe it'll be like 8.5 or something, that we'll do an episode on the Lionsgate portal. And then we have a big uh, Lunaza Lionsgate portal ritual coming up on 8.8. Um, with all those who are in our Shadow Seekers membership and our, in our Coven of Midnight's Flame, you guys all have complimentary tickets to that ritual, but we're going to open that up for the public too. So anybody who wants to join us will be able to get a ticket through donation and they can join us live or they'll also get a replay of it. This is our big prosperity ritual of the year. We are going to tap into this energy that is so potent at the Lionsgate portal and we're going to send intentions of abundance and prosperity out to the universe. Um, we'll be working with, um, I believe, Lakshmi and Ganesha again this year. So can't wait for that ritual. You'll find out more information as we get closer to that. 
And also, just I did want to mention too, because I mentioned it earlier, our Demystifying Witchcraft course is going to be released um, sometime this month, I think closer to the end of the month. So for those of you who weren't able to enroll or aren't a member of our Shadow Seekers where we um, offered it the first time, we're going to open that up to everybody. Um, current Shadow Seekers will get a discount on the course. Um, of course, that's for those who haven't already purchased it, um, but everybody else in the public, you'll, have, you'll be able to buy it as well. We're keeping the price low um, here in the beginning. Uh, hopefully it'll be affordable, um, but it's a great course. It's like, at this point, I think it's 25 hours of recorded material. It goes through everything you would need to know to kind of get started in the craft. So it's very good for those who are newer to the craft, um, don't know a lot, are looking to have like kind of a one-stop source for information and not have to feel like they're Googling and pulling stuff from everywhere. Um, but it's also a good course for those who've never had formal training. This is the trainings that I use to initiate people into um, our own in-person coven. And then as a bonus, those who join, um, who, who enroll in the course will have the opportunity and an invitation to join our online coven, Coven of the Night's Flame. So, um, okay. Um, so anybody have any other questions? I'm just looking at the chat really quick here. So Michelle said, if you don't have your chart, how do you go about starting that? Okay, good question. Um, if you go to astro.com, you'll be able to get a free chart there. It's just going to ask you to put in your birth date and your birth time and your birth place. So if you don't know those things like the place or the time, um, see if you can find somebody who knows that information. But that's how you get started doing it. And then Michelle, because you're in our Shadow Seekers membership, in the beginning of all of the astrology classes that we have, all those workshops, there's also a little um, tutorial on how to cast your chart as well. Um, so I'll see if I can find that and um, specifically send that little video to you. But for anybody else, anybody, you can just go to astro.com and you can get one there. Amy said she's been watching the money astrology class and she's got many questions. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions about that one. Um, you can send some of those to me if you've got some. All right, well, I don't see any other questions right now. So I am going to, um, I'm going to sign off for the night. It's been great spending time with you all and I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Um, so if you are watching back in replay, you can also leave questions and comments. I'll go back later. I'll answer all of those. If you guys like what you hear, make sure to leave a thumbs up or a heart somewhere in the video that will help us get this to the feet of more people. And of course, if you're watching back later in YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel, Body, Mind, Witchcraft, and you won't miss a single episode in the future. All right, until next time, blessed be.